He wants to bring us refreshment. For some of us, we feel so weary that there's just a dryness that's settled in our heart and there's an exhaustion and yet we've never done better in our life. Things around us are really going good and yet we are just exhausted. There's a weariness that's settled in. And Paul addressed this in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. He said, let us not become weary in doing good. Don't become weary in doing good. So he's reminding us that even when things around us are going really good, for some of us, like I said, our life has never been better, and yet there's, there's this spirit of weariness that is settled in our life. But the only thing that is going to break that is his spirit and his life. Let's open our Bibles this morning to John chapter 6 and verse 63. For some of us, we are just, we feel like we're running on fumes. And Jesus is so kind. He recognizes that and he acknowledges it. And he doesn't say you're weak, toughen up, dig deep. He doesn't sound like Jesse Haney to me on the mountain. In John chapter 6 and verse 63, we see the response of Jesus. He looks at us in, in our, our dry place, in that place where we feel like we are so weary. And he says, the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. I want that to sink into your heart and, and put that in the back of your mind because we're going to dive deeper into that in just a little bit. It says, the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Spirit and life. He is spirit and he is life. Spirit and life. So without him, we can die a spiritual death, many of us, while we are sitting in church. You say, how is that possible? You, we can die while sitting in his house. You say, how can that even happen? I'm going to church. How can, how can I shrivel up and, and be separated from him when I'm sitting in a metal chair with flies and, 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 and fans and all that? How can that happen? Don't you see the effort that I'm putting into this? Yes, God sees the effort. But if we don't experience a touch of his presence, we can shrivel up and die. It is a daily encounter. It is encountering the Lord. It's, it's understanding the worth of His presence, the value of His anointing. There's joy unspeakable and full of glory in His presence. There's healing in His presence. There, there is life in His presence. And that's why when we come together, we actually are seeing ourselves energized, sparked with His anointing. There's, there's a value in his worth. There's a value in his presence. So Jesus is looking for something this morning, and what he's looking for is a friend. He's looking for a friend. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's looking for a friend. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm his friend. Just make that clear. I'm his friend. Jesus is looking for people that he can whisper to. He wants to whisper to people, and he understands that a whisper requires us to lean in. If you've ever heard someone whisper that's actually good at it, some people whisper and their whispers louder than their actual speaking voice. But when God whispers, you have to lean in. You have to pay attention. You have to listen to what he is saying. But so often, we choose to turn up the noise of this world. And we don't choose to recognize the worth, the weight of his presence. So we tend to fill our lives with a bunch of noise. The chaos and the confusion and the circumstances and the issues and the fact that your husband took you to a top of a mountain and you're trying to figure out why. You can't understand it. And so we fill our lives up with consuming stuff. And the result of this is spiritual separation. And we have this mindset of, I will use God when I need God, right? I'll take God and, and, and my relationship with him, and I'll put it on a shelf. And yet Jesus, throughout the word, he calls himself the bread of life. He even goes to the woman at the well, and he says, drink of me, and you'll never thirst again. And yet at the same time, we're supposed to be hungry and thirsty for him time and time again. Because when we eat of him, we just want more. He's like a Lay's potato chip. You can't just have one. you got to have more. 
And he even instructs us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily, daily bread. bread. So this is a daily encounter. No one wants dried, stale, crusty bread. Then when you go to look at it and it looks like it's about two weeks old, you got to check it for mold. No one wants that. And yet that's how we treat our relationship with God. It is dry, crusty, a little stale, kind of crumbling at certain places. Why? Because we haven't had daily fellowship with Him. It's going to Him and saying, give me this day my daily bread. I, I want to encounter you. I want to eat with you. Refresh my soul. Not crumbly, stale, dried up nastiness. You know, my parents, we lived in Alabama for 20 years, and my mom was asked to come and sing at this fancy gallows, this banquet that was going on in Mobile. And my mom had recently lost uh, a substantial amount of weight. She was on a low-carb diet, and she looked really good. And so she went to go put on a dress for this gala, and uh, none of the dresses in her closet fit because she had lost so much weight. So she went into the deep, hidden corners of her closet. Do any of y'all have those sections where you are now, where you used to be, and where you know you're never going back to? But you got to hold on to those just in case you go back to that spot, right? And, and, and my mom and I, we still have those you know, sections in our closet. So my mom went deep, deep into the closet, and she found one of her old pageant dresses. Yes, Miss Denise was in a pageant. She was Miss Mobile College. She was actually Miss Alabama. And uh, she was in the Miss America pageant. And so this dress was just an 80s masterpiece, right? It was bedazzled from the top to the bottom. It was just a sparkly, you know, sequenced, blingy type thing. But it fit her to perfection. Mama Denise looked good. And so I was about 10 years old at the time. I wasn't invited to this big banquet. And so my dad and, and my mom went to it. And they're all sitting around the big round tables. And they had just finished their dinner. And they asked mom to come up and to sing. And when she stands up, she hears ting, 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 ting. And she's thinking, that's a strange noise. What's that noise? Didn't think much about it. She begins to walk. And she keeps hearing this tinging noise and she looks behind her and there is a trail of beads. Her dress had dry rotted. After all, it was 20 years old. It had been stuck in the back of the closet in Mobile, Alabama, heat and humidity. With every step she took, with every breath she had, she was losing about 30 beads. By the end of the night, she had just this sheer slip black dress on and she had a Ziploc baggie full of beads. She came home, and Dad, still to this day, won't let her forget that moment. <laughs> but how many times have we treated our relationship with God like that dress? Right? We, we say, God, I, I love you. I care about you. I know you. But I'm going to throw my relationship with you in a closet, just like Mama Denise threw that dress in the closet. And when I need you, I'll come and get you. Right? We know that we're saved. We know what we believed because it's what we first heard, so therefore we have to believe it forevermore. Might not line up with the Word of God, but hey, we believe it. We, we know that we've experienced the Lord. It might have been 20 years ago. It might have been at BBS or church camp. It might have been a, a moment even 10 years ago. But we take that, that moment and we throw it in the closet and we spend no time right now, in the now, waiting on Him. The scripture says that we're to minister unto the Lord. That means we're to sit at His feet. We're to worship Him. We're to look to Him and say, what do you want? And this morning He's saying, I'm looking for a friend. So we become dry. We, we, be, we become crusty, a little moldy around the edges. And so we find ourselves saying stuff like, maybe I'm just in a dry spell. Maybe, maybe God is trying to teach me something. Maybe I'm just in this weary desert because I'm acting like my life is looking like Miss Denise's dress. With every step I take, I look behind me and I don't see surely and goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. I'm seeing chaos and just cray cray following me every single step 
of my life. And, and so our life, it looks like Miss Denise's dress. And so we say, God, maybe you're trying to teach me something. Maybe you're just done with me. I've made too many mistakes. I've, I've reached the end of my course with you. No, maybe we have lost our first love. Maybe we've stopped taking time to be his friend. He is looking for friends. He is looking for someone that he can talk to and he can walk with. See, so many people, they want to be friends with God, but he has very few friends who just want him. They want what comes with him. They want what accompanies him. They want what surrounds him. They want the fame. They want the recognition. They want the authority. They want the books and the buildings and the campuses. They want what comes with him, but few people want just him. He's looking for friends. He's looking for someone that he can talk to and he can walk with. The scripture in the New Testament, it actually describes one of the names of Jesus and the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. And the paraclete is where we derive the word parallel. That means that he's right there. He's standing next to us. So if I'm standing here, here's Jesus. He's parallel. He's next to us. And yet we don't take the time to look. And he's right there. He's right there. He's, he's our ever-present help in our time of need. He's closer than any brother. He's right there next to us. And yet we get so distracted because there's stuff going on in the world and there's stuff going on in our life and there's stuff going on with our stuff and we get so caught up, we forget to just turn and look to him because he knows that if we turn and look his way for one second, we're going to get caught up for an hour. If you ever truly have just taken time and said, I'm going to pray, which as a mom can be an interesting thing to do, but I'm going to take time and I'm going to pray. That, that five minutes, if you truly are seeking him, it can turn into 30 minutes. It can turn into an hour. Why? Because you, you've looked his direction. And, and time with him, oh, it just it becomes something different. So we have to become his friends. He's looking for friends. This is what Jesus wants. Jesus wants faithful, loving friends who will never leave him because he has never left us. He's looking for friends. He's looking for a bride. He is, he is looking for faithfulness. He is looking for those that he can talk to and he can walk with. We see an example of friendship through the life of Moses. Let's look at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33 verses 11 through 18. Starting in verse 11 in Exodus 33, it says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Can you imagine your name there? What, what an incredible um, opportunity and what an incredible thing to know that Jesus can speak to you face to face. God is looking for a friend. Let's go on in verse 13. I'm going to read this one out of the Amplified. Moses said, I pray that if I have found favor in your sight, show me now your way that I might know you becoming progressively and more deeply and intimately acquainted with you, perceiving and recognizing and understanding more strongly and clearly that I might find favor in your sight. Reading this, it really echoes the, the prayer of uh, Paul that he prayed in the book of Philippians at the end of his life, that I might know him more. That was his prayer. So Moses is desiring to know God as friend. He wants to know him more. It goes on in verse 14. It says, And the Lord said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. This goes back to what I opened up this morning with. He wants to give you rest. Rest for the turmoil. Rest for the weariness. Rest for trying to figure out, what do I do? How do I do this? Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. When it rains, it pours. He wants to give you rest. How do you find rest? You only find rest in His presence. You only find rest, true rest, in His glory. 
That's the only place. It's, it's not through three steps. It's not through a massage, even though those are quite nice. It's not through a pedicure. It's not through hiking, obviously. It's not through hiking. True rest is only found in His presence. It's only found in His anointing. Let's go on in verse 15. Moses said to the Lord, If your presence does not go with me, do not carry us up from here. That is such a bold prayer. If your presence isn't coming with us, I don't want to go. I don't want a new building. I don't want more people if His presence is not there. I don't want more authority, more fame, more recognition if He is not in the middle of it. That's such a bold prayer. Moses is saying, you have my heart. You are my friend. You are what I desire. Nothing else. What a bold prayer. I don't know a whole lot of people in today's society that would pray that prayer. Verse 16, Moses asked God a question. He said, how will we know that we have found favor in your eyes unless you go with us? The Lord responds in verse 17, and he said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have asked, for you have found favor and mercy in my sight, and I know you personally and by name. So this is friendship. He's, God is saying, I know you. I, I recognize your face. I know you by name. I know what you're going through. I know what you're dealing with. Tell me what you want. Can you imagine God coming to you and saying, whatever you want, you tell me what you want, let me know. I'll give it to you. Oh, I know for myself I'd have a list of about ten things, and it wouldn't be the response that Moses had. Moses, he looks at God in verse 18, and he says, show me your glory. Wow. Show me your glory. He responded in wisdom. Moses said, I want you. I have three million people who are following me. That is bigger than any church in America. I looked it up. Three million people. They, they are literally hanging on the very breath of Moses. Talk about authority. Talk about power. Three million people. This, this is Moses. He, he had experienced wealth. He had all the livestock, all of the gold, all of the silver handed to him when they left Egypt. The Egyptians just handed it over to the Israelites as they were set free from slavery. This is Moses who held the rod of God, lifted it at the Red Sea, and with a blast of God's nostrils, that Red Sea, it parted. This is Moses who saw the ten demon gods of Egypt completely destroyed, annihilated, and he saw it through God's mighty hand. This is Moses, water out of a rock. He saw Pharaoh shaking under the presence of God. He saw miracle after miracle, the hand of God, time and time again. And Moses, after all of this, he could have asked for so much, and yet he knew he had favor with the king. He knew that God knew his name. And Moses, he responds to the Lord, and he says, I want you. Don't give me more fame. Don't give me more authority. Don't give me more stuff. I don't want all my prayers answered. I just want you. I really don't know if God came and looked at me in the face and said, what do you want if I would respond with just you? I, I really don't know if that's the first thing that would come out of my mouth. I think I'd have a list, like I said, of about ten other things. But he's looking for friends. He's looking for friends. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's a bride, not a denomination, not a church, not a ministry, not a person. There is a bride that is emerging in this hour. And if you don't recognize it, I'm going to sound like Paul, wake up, oh sleeper. There's a bride that's emerging and it's pure, and it's spotless. It's not a carbon copy of this world. For one time, you can actually see the church resembling the bridegroom, not resembling the world. It's hard to see, but if you look hard enough, you can see it. 
And Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, it's what we're called to become. It says that he's looking for a bride of like kind whose garments have been made washed white through his blood, who the wrinkles, the wrinkles have been removed. It's by him through their fellowship. This, this is friendship. And, and that, that fellowship, I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. You can't do it for the person sitting next to you. We know this. It is me waking up and saying, give us this day my daily bread. It's me on my own time, my own accord. It's a heart that, that if God literally shows up in front of you, you don't respond with, here's my ten things. You respond with, I just want you. And it starts now. It starts with friendship now. He's searching. He's looking for a bride. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. He's looking for faithful friends. He's looking for those who want a relationship with Him who are okay with sitting down and talking to him. Mom, when she was ministering uh, in a church, this was actually way before she even met my dad, so a couple years ago, uh, she was ministering in this church, and, and the pastor came to my mom and said, I want to share with you a dream that I had, and I want you to take note. This is a dream. This is not scripture. This is not something that actually happened, but this is a dream. And in this dream, the pastor said he was at what looked to be the Academy Awards of Heaven. Just this auditorium full of the mighty and, and, and powerful men and women of God, the who's who in the Christian zoo. I mean, these are the people that, that we absolutely love to listen to. The Billy Grahams and, and the Copelands and the Savells and the Hagans and John G. Lake. And I mean, your favorite person. Think of your favorite person that you just absolutely love to listen to. They were sitting there in the service, in this auditorium. And the pastor said about that time in this dream, Jesus came out with an envelope and he stood behind the podium and he said, it's now time for me to announce the best Christian award. Whoa. You all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I know who I would choose, right? You have your favorite person. We all do. And Jesus said, this award goes to the person who's always been there for me, who's done the most for me in my kingdom. And that award goes to Ann Jackson. Everyone's like, who's Ann Jackson? I mean, did I miss that century? What's going on here? Everyone's looking around trying to figure it out. About that time, this very small, unassuming woman made her way from the very back of the auditorium up to the stage. And Jesus said, many of you are wondering why I chose Ann Jackson. He took his arm and he put his arm around Ann and he said, I chose Ann because she was always there for me when I needed her. A lot of you, you got so busy building my kingdom, it turned into your kingdom, got a little sidetracked every once in a while, lost focus, but Ann never lost focus. She was right there for me whenever I needed her. At two in the morning when my heart would be breaking because I would look out and I would see what my children were doing, the choices that they were making. Anne would wake up and she would say, God, I sense that your heart is hurting. Jesus, I feel that you are in pain. I want to worship you. I want to minister to you until you're better. He said, Anne was always there for me. Your hunger, your desire, it is more important than accomplishment. You pressing in to choosing to be an Ann Jackson, it is more important than anything you will ever do in this world. Your hunger, your hunger. And so Jesus is looking for a response out of you. He wants a response, and it grieves him when he comes to you, he's the paraclete. Remember, he's right there. And he stands next to you, and we are so caught up in the chaos and the turmoil and the circumstances. And we're so caught up in even our life 
We're so caught up with what needs to be done and what needs to, to happen. And we don't take the time to turn and to look at him. And it grieves him. And, and, and we say words like it grieves him because we see that in the scripture. But let's put it in 2021 terms. It hurts his heart. Yeah. It breaks him. When we don't take time and just look to him. So we get to choose. We get to choose to be an Ann Jackson. You know, there's different levels of friendship. There's, a, there's an acquaintance. This is the person that you know a little bit about, right? You know a little bit about them. And, and yet if you see them at the grocery store at Super One, you have to go the other way because you're not quite sure if they know your name. It's called a social media friend, Facebook friend, Instagram. You follow them, but you're not quite sure if they follow and like your stuff. And so you know them, you just kind of smile and wave, and then you run the other direction, right? That, 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 that's a friend. And then there's a friend that you don't see that often, maybe once every couple of months, even a couple of years. You don't really see them that much. And yet at the same time, you catch up and you talk and you have a good time, but you can't really share with them too much information because you know they're just going to go blab it all over town, and it's a small town, and you really got to be careful when you talk to that one friend. And then there's a friend that you can call at 2 in the morning and you can say, I need you. And they will get out of bed, they'll drop everything and they're right there. And they know that you will do the same for them. Perhaps Jesus is calling you. You haven't been sleeping at night. You're like, God, it must be the pizza. It must be that extra cup of coffee I had. Why can't I rest? Why can't I sleep? Perhaps Jesus is calling you. He's been tugging at your heart. Be my friend. Meet with me. Get out of bed. Get out of what's comfortable. And spend time at my feet. Just like the woman with the alabaster jar. I choose to lay down my life to worship you. Hallelujah, what a great word that we heard today. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for joining us online, praise God. We'd love to connect with you and stay connected with you, so check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and also for upcoming events for everything The Place Church does, check out our website at h2hm.org. Also, we have four ways to give, and those four ways are listed below. We appreciate you partnering with us. We love you very much. God bless you, church.